Good evening. Welcome back. Before we uh, turn to our last session on trade and investment in the Atlantic, I'm very pleased to say that we will have a, a very special conversation uh, with Dr. Aminata Torre, former Prime Minister of Senegal, uh, moderated by Jim Colby, Senior Transatlantic Fellow at GMF and Senior Advisor at McLarty Associates. So please welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tere, uh, for joining us here for this uh, conversation. You can see there's more chairs. You're going to be staying for the panel discussion, uh, which uh, follows. But uh, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. This is a very special uh, lady. And I, I asked her beforehand uh, how I should address her as Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, Dr. Tere, Madam Tere. She says, well, doctor lasts forever. So we'll, uh, I'll keep call her Dr. Tere for this uh, conversation. But she truly is a visionary a leader uh, in Africa. But I want to start with something that's really important. You are known as what's called a footballus, <laughs> which means that you are a woman who's played football, but not just somebody who is a spectator, not just one of those political leaders that cheers for their country's team. You played football for the gazelles, I believe they were called, the uh, Dakar, the Senegal gazelles. Is that right? That's true. Do you still play? Well, no, that was quite. <laughs> oh, Do you go know. and cheer for the team? I play another kind of game. <laughs> uh, I wish the rule was <laughs> the same, but uh, <laughs> yes, I, I tried soccer when I was young, and that was quite uh, innovative, I would say. My mom was a pole. Um, at that time, a girl playing football in the street was unusual, let's say. Um, but I mean, it. I think it. Do you still cheer for the team? You yes, go I do. Okay. I do. I was at the stadium the last time the national team was playing. So I love football. Do you have a second distinction? You're also known as the Iron Lady, and of course you share that with another former prime minister, late prime minister of another country, who is also known as the Iron Lady. I, I don't know why it is that strong women who are leaders in the countries are known as the Iron Ladies. The men are just guys. Uh, but the women seem to always get this distinction. So I, I just want to know, uh, do you think it's a fair comparison? No, it's and not. It's, it's a, not. It's a gender bias, you, actually. Um, in, in many places, and particularly in Africa, I mean, there are some stereotyping of women. You're supposed to be kind, nice. We know that doesn't exist. Um, so when you, <laughs> when you start being affirmative and you know, defending your space, then you are an iron lady. But you're just a lady, a regular lady <laughs> fighting for your interests, and that's the way it is. But, you know, I mean, you have to... Sometimes it's, it's not necessarily a compliment. Uh, it means that you're rigid, which is not fair, I think. But, well, I mean, it's being standing say, for your... Some might you say it is. means you're tough. And you have to be that in politics, well, don't you? You have to be tough. I mean, in the world we live in, I mean... Of course, you can be tough, but be human. That's Absolutely. It both goes together. Well, partly Dr. Touré, or then Prime Minister Touré, got uh, this title as Iron Lady because prior to being Prime Minister, she was the Justice uh, Minister. But when she became Prime Minister, I'm going to come back to the Justice Minister in a moment. When she became Prime Minister, which, by the way, she announced to the world herself on Sunday evening that she was the Prime Minister. Uh, and they, they assumed that by the end of the week she would have a cabinet, but within less than 24 hours the next day, you had your full cabinet announced. I'm wondering if Prime Minister Maliki from Iraq sought your advice since it took him 10 months to get his cabinet in place, but I, I won't ask, really ask that. How did you do it in 24 hours? Well, I mean, you have to work fast and get <laughs> down to business. Uh, with the best team you can put together. Um, of course, I mean, you, I mean, in the meantime, you have to think about it. I mean, you know people and, uh, uh, of course, all of that in consultation with the president. So we were lucky we could put that team um, fairly in a good timeline. You must have had some idea beforehand of who you had in mind. Yeah, sure, you, and that's, that's the way it goes. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, before, as I mentioned, before you were prime minister, you were 
you were justice minister, and you launched a very deep and far-reaching anti-corruption uh, campaign. In fact, that is probably one of the most important reasons why you became uh, the, the prime minister. Uh, you went after the former president's son in Senegal. You went, uh, you assured that the, uh, of the arrest of the former president of Chad. Uh, let me just ask you this. Why do you think that fighting corruption uh, is so very important? I mean, even in a lot of developed countries, a lot of people will say, you know, it's just the price of doing business there. But why do you think the fighting corruption and being against corruption is so important? Well, I think, first of all, I like to say that, as you're hinting at, corruption is a human activity. It's not specific to Africa. No, uh, certainly it's not. And uh, unfortunately, we tend to hear that. Um, but what we've been lacking is solid mechanism to fight it, strong platform to do that. And it's important for all societies because um, if people don't feel like they're treated equally, and that's what corruption speaks to. I'm taking advantage from the position I am, um, taking public money for my own self. Um, if it prevails, I do believe you may run into instability when it go to a big scale. In Africa, we have to particularly fight corruption because we are called developing countries because we lack resources, right? Um, so if those resources don't go to saving life of women, I've been working for many, many years in uh, reproductive health. Um, if it doesn't go to education, you have kids who are bright but don't have a chance to, to learn. If it doesn't go to strengthening the health system, as we talked about it this morning, um, <coughs> Where are you going? When are we going to develop? So it's even more an emergency for Africa to make sure that public funding goes to saving lives, to sending kids to school for drinkable water, and so on. Um, so I think it's a, it, 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 it's something we have to tackle, um, and it it goes even beyond corruption. It's all it's just speaking to good governance, right? Um, and making sure that. Uh, you know, their accountability system. And Senegal made some progress. For instance, we do have a law that obliged leaders to declare their assets. I can tell you that in Senegal it was quite revolutionary because culturally, even if you own your asset and you work for them, you just don't speak about it. You don't want a lot of people to ask you money. <laughs> and uh, you uh, don't do it. But the law came and everybody has to declare his assets. So has the campaign against corruption and, as you said, good governance for good governance, but as the effort to fight against this and create more transparent government, is that continued since you left uh, office? Are you satisfied that it's continuing? I think uh, it has to, and it is going on, and it has to be strengthened. It's an ongoing process. It will never stop. Huh? Uh, but the good thing was to start it, and I must also go give credit to the, to, to the president, mainly, because that was part of his uh, campaigning, I was, his, uh, uh, I was leading his electoral campaign. So that was a strong promise made to the Senegalese people. Uh, so that was uh, implemented. And it has to continue and to outlive those who studied it. So it has to be really deeply rooted within our institution. It's part of institution building. Um, and we, we have this debate in, in Africa whether we need to have strong men. We don't speak about strong women yet, or strong institution. And I, 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 I do believe that we need strong institution. I mean, the men, they're just passing. They're not supposed to be here for good. In Senegal, it's two terms. It should be two terms of five years each. And after that, you will have another president coming, another government. But the institution have to be very stable, strong. And for that, you need good governance. You need uh, you know, a system that really watch over the use of public money. Let me ask you, going along with this, I think it's in the, in the same vein there, a question about democracy, that is civil rights, political rights for the people in, in your country and in Africa and the world over for that matter. Uh, Freedom House rates only four countries in West Africa as being free. Senegal is one of those, only one has a rating as high as Senegal and none has one that is trending upwards as Senegal is continuing to a trend upwards. How, how is that level of political rights for people and civil rights 
personal liberty has been achieved and uh, how important is that to maintaining the confidence of the people in the government? Well, that's not an easy question. Um, I can speak better to the case of Senegal. It's been a historical process, if you look into it. Um, we organized several elections that went, you know, I mean, fairly organized, and the result, the people were content with the result. Um, it's, a, it's a building process, I would say. Um, other countries in Africa didn't have that chance. Um, I hope they will get there. But one of the, 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 the way of doing it is to make sure that you do have a civil society that is strong, uh, that can bring the issue to the forefront. Um, you ha also have to make sure that people have access to information, so free press is important. Uh, raising education level. And I must say, to be fair to, to the continent, we are seeing progress, not fast enough, not wide enough, but we are seeing progress. So, I wish the case of Senegal will also sort of uh, inspire uh, more countries. But uh, globally, I think we are seeing a trend going upward, which is a good thing. Well, I hope you're right about that. Uh, I mean, it's, we had, of course, a big surge towards democracy in, in the world after the end, of the, the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union and its empire. But uh, it's been a little bit stagnant for a while. But you, you're hopeful about democracy moving forward? I don't see any other system that could replace it. And um, I used to say that uh, we are seeing an increase of literacy and intellectual production worldwide. And Africa is no exception, meaning that young people are better educated than their parents, and they have access to, to information through internet, etc. So I think we are, we are bound to having more uh, citizenship expressing itself, citizens so being more demanding toward their government. Um, that's what we have seen in the Arab world and that what we have seen also in Senegal. Um, I recall that in 2011, there were some uh, turbulences in, in, in Senegal. Um, the former president wanted to, to run for the third time. There were discussions. He should not be able to do that because the constitution didn't allow it. And the people mobilized massively to oppose the project, but finally we organized the election. Of course, he, he lost. And, uh, so we are facing different type of citizen now, including in Africa. And they will be much more demanding, and the government will have to respond to that. Um, so I think there is no other way. Finally, before we go to the audience, let me just ask you one question. You're, you're such a leader in uh, women's rights and advocating for women and empowering women. Uh, in Africa and throughout the world. And you've been very, very, you worked in the United Nations, uh, UNFPA for a number of years. Uh, you've been very active in women's reproductive uh, rights. Uh, and yet West Africa still has the highest fertility rate, I believe, of any part of the world. Do you see this changing? It has to change. It's changing, but too slowly. Um, that's uh, my, 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 I'm advocating for really increasing the pace of change in, in Africa, including in Senegal. Um, there's no situation that is really stagnant, but it's all about accelerating the processes. And that's been my mantra. We need to accelerate things. Um, and the way to do it is to be much more proactive in terms of, you're talking about the fertility rate. It's, <coughs> it's an obstacle to many things, but it's difficult to talk about it because it's very much ingrained in... In, in the culture, in the, in the religion, some, somehow. Although some Muslim countries um, you know, have uh, brought down the, the, the number of, of, of children per, per women. So we have to tackle that and be very brave because, I mean, you have to, you're talking now to the core of the society because when you talk about relationship between men and women, reproductive issue, they are very sensitive, but we have to tackle them. Uh, otherwise, the population is uh, increasing in a rate that doesn't allow the government mm -hmm. to keep up because every year in Senegal you have to uh, attend to 300,000 kids starting primary school. So you're always in a catch-up mode and it doesn't give you time to be strategic and address a strategic vision. You are sort of managing uh, urgent matters all the time. So that, is, that has to be addressed. And the way of doing it is increasing, bringing education to women. 
That's, that's, if I would invest, the key of the key is education, education, education. To women, to young people, we talked about yesterday, uh, an education that also will help you to find, to find good jobs, uh, being, investing in vocational training, um, in ITs, because I think we have also to be very creative in the way we're going to deliver education, we're going to deliver services using, um, you know, what the, the technology is offering us. And for that matters, uh, Africa is doing quite well. I was explaining to my friend in the U.S. that you have more people owning cell phone in Africa than in the U.S. and Canada combined. That brings me maybe to what we're going to discuss in the coming panel, that we have an emerging uh, middle class, uh, and that needs to accelerate. So you will have more people you know, graduating from you know, the low class, poor class, to the middle, where they will have access to... Um, social services and would have a certain purchasing power. I, I have many more questions that I'd like to ask, particularly along the lines of empowering uh, women, and maybe I'll get to one at the very end, but I want to take some questions from the audience, so let me uh, uh, take a couple of questions here, if we have some that uh, from Madame Touré that uh, anybody would like. Let's start with one right over here, I see. Uh, we'll wait for the microphone to come to you. There you go. Uh, Dr. Touré. My, uh, my question is the following. Um, what are the major challenges being a woman as prime minister in Africa? And the second question I had is, do you sense that there is a lack of leadership in the world? Because that's one of the greatest challenges we're facing. Like Brazil has elections on Sunday, and one of the major issues is that we do not feel that neither the candidates are good leaders for the future of the country. And I, it seems to be a worldwide trend. Why isn't politics generating statesmen and better leaders? Thank you. Let's, let me take two questions, and then we'll come back and ask you. And I think we have one back here. Yes, if you'd identify yourself, please. Yes, hi, my name is Sonia Toro, and I represent here the EU Africa Chamber of Commerce. I'm very happy to, to attend this conversation. And I just wanted to have your view on two, two things uh, for which we advocate uh, in Brussels, where we are located. Uh, what do you think about also investing in entrepreneurship for women? I think that in Africa, women have sort of many skills to, for being very good entrepreneurs. And also another element for which we, um, we, we are about to launch a program is also mentorship. You know, having role models like you, I think it's also you know, very good for, for, for young women in Africa. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the you first like question about you know, what is it? Challenges for women in, in Africa and how do we get better leaders? Yeah, well he was asking me what's the difference being a woman leader in, uh, in, in Senegal. When you reach to a certain level of leadership, I think there is a mixed feeling. People sort of evaluate you on the basis of what you're able to deliver. So your gender sort of fade away, I would say. But at the same time, uh, you do have also the strong cultural background when people sort of get angry because, I mean, they, not, they don't find their way around. I mean, they, 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 they beat on the, the old gender stereotyping, which bring the iron women thing. <laughs> you don't hear an iron man. Um, because when you affirm as a woman, I mean, it's not a characteristic that, is, that belongs to women. But I think people tend to evaluate you as a leader. Which brings me to your second question. Well, people who are criticizing the current leadership are not into politics. So why don't you come and join politics? <laughs> so we'll improve the crowd. Uh, that's a way of looking at it. I have a lot of friends who are intellectual, etc. Um, I've been discussing with them that you have to, I mean, politics is the only way we know is to get into power, right? I mean, you have to go through that. That's democracy as we know it. You have to go and compete, but if you don't compete, you're not there. Uh, you're a spectator, I would say. Um, but what it speaks to is I think our world is in transition. Um, the old world is over, but the new one is still in a question mark mode. Um, and I think it speaks to all of us what is the new world going to be looking like? And I think all leaders are struggling with. And maybe one answer would be to look into what I know best, which is the human rights framework. I think we are all longing for a more equal world. 
uh, more equality between men and women, north and south. Um, we are all also wishing for more peace, but how to get there in a world where you're seeing emerging powers, uh, all the global powers are losing ground but don't want to let go. Africa is also claiming a place. So let's acknowledge that it's not easy for leaders. So I think that people perceive as not sufficient leadership, but I think that's the world itself that is sort of evolving in a way that you know, a lot of questions are still open. That's the way I would look at it. But I think it depends. It, you, it's like when you talk about the international community, you do have strong leadership here and there. I don't want to be, you know, mix myself within the internal affair of Brazil, but, you know, we have seen good leadership in, in, in Brazil, not only because she's a lady, um, but I think you have moved ahead in some questions in, in, in other countries we are seeing also inspiring leadership. So, I mean, it's a mix. It's a mix back, let's say. And but why don't you join and then you improve the crowd? Eh? And how about entrepreneurship opportunities for women? Uh, I, I do believe that one of the questions um, I was asked um, last week, um, what do you see as one of the challenges to move Africa forward? And my answer was giving more power to women for two reasons. First of all, um, they play a central role in the society. Of course, they are not recognized. Um, they are not paid back. But I don't see any society, any family, um, neighborhood that can survive without women playing their role. Uh, of course, that has to translate into more leadership, and particularly into giving more economic power to women. Because many studies show that when women are economically empowered, the, fami the, f the family benefits. Um, I mean, there is a lot of studies and research on that one. So I totally uh, agree with you, but how to do it? One of my response was to say, and I suggested that, I didn't prevail, that we need bank for women, women banks, that would really support all these women that are working in, you know, in, in very small enterprises, um, you know, uh, that are holding businesses, that are holding the families also together. There are no mechanism to really support them economically, and it's time to have this you know, bank for women, for instance. Uh, graduating from microfinance, as we know it, to something that is higher and that will give them sufficient funds to, to succeed. Let me take very quickly the question okay. right next, very Thank short. You. Thank you, Taha Amir from Morocco. I would like to ask you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Prime Minister of Senegal, uh, about if for French-speaking uh, African countries, if there is any stability outlooks outside the, re the perpetual renewal, uh, renewal of, uh, of defense treaties with uh, France. Thank you. Okay. Want to take that? You might, yes, yeah, please go ahead and you can nice just thought. tell us the thrust. Of, my French is certainly not good enough okay. to be able to. I see a lady who's a general with the. Uh, oh, okay. I thank you, sir. I would like to congratulate uh, Prime Minister, my sister. I am Brigadier General from Mali, and I know it's very difficult to be at this level. So I, I face a lot of challenges. First of all, cultural aspects. And what I want to, to know with you, what I can do to involve more and more women in the DDR process we face now, the reconstruction process, you talk about training. I know, but it's a high-level political matter. I can't do anything. I have to work, to work. I am 14 years, I am in the army, but I don't know what strategies, right strategy, I have to bring to meet with women, to bring them on board. Okay. Because always, I was said, you are military, you don't know anything in political level. What do you think about that? What I can do? I thank right. you. thank you. I think we ended up with three questions here. Yes, I'll try to be brief because I... <laughs> if you, know, you just put them all into one time, and make yes. it very brief. Um, it was in, in, in French, the first one, she was thanking and asking me what do I think about the situation in, in Mali. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that things are getting back to, to normal. Um, Mali has also displayed some dynamism in terms of democracy, but uh, overnight almost, I mean, everything collapsed. 
uh, it, it speaks to how fragile our individual state can be and how interconnected also we are. Because I think Mali uh, leave the consequences of you know, the aftermath of the situation in Libya. Um, the situation in Mali was not generated by necessarily internal dynamics, but it was a mix of it. And of course, I mean, the, the, the fall of uh, uh, the, uh, the situation in, in Libya sort of uh, uh, influenced negatively uh, the, the immediate neighbors. Um, uh, what I like to, 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 to say is that I do believe that women can play a strong role in terms of reconciliation. We have no other option anyway, and we have, we have to learn from processes, whether it's in South Africa, in, 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 in Rwanda, or in other part of the world, Bosnia, for instance, where women you know, have to, to be at the table and to put issues uh, at the table and so we can find solutions also for, for women. Um, that's what I can say for, 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 for the, the general, and I must acknowledge here that it's sort of a unique case. And we don't, have, we don't have female general in the army in Senegal yet, so I have to salute that coming from Mali, just to show you that things evolve in Africa, having a general. Uh, in Senegal, the chief of police is a lady. Uh, for me, it's an impressive achievement. Uh, so Africa is moving. Um, what we have to do is to just you know, um, set example. It can be extremely tough. And you were asking me, what does it, what's the difference when we are a lady? And, you know, the journalist or your opponent know where to push, you know, um, because, I mean, they, you know, I mean, you're supposed to be uh, all the time well-dressed and uh, good, you know, in a good humor and et cetera. So they would pick on you uh, all the time so to get you, you know, on your, on your nerve. But, you know, I mean, that's what the game is. You have to be strong. You have to be stronger than men. And then, you know, the younger generation, you can inspire them and they will follow up. That's the only way. It can be a very a tough job, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. Well, thank you. I think that's a great note for us to end on. I said at the outset that we were going to be having a conversation with what a, an individual I thought was a, is a visionary and extraordinary leader, not just a woman, but a leader for Africa. And I hope you'll agree with me. And let us thank Madame Touré for her. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Bruce Stokes from the Pew Research Center. Welcome, everyone, to our uh, final session of the evening, uh, Partners in Prosperity, Trading, and Investing Across the Atlantic. Um, we are going to, as we have with other sessions, start with a short video. Global economic relations have dramatically evolved in the last decades. While trade agreements are slowly unlocking the potential of greater economic ties throughout the Atlantic, increased investments are creating the potential for long-term relations. At the same time, measures taken to limit them are indicators of how open Atlantic economies really are. The shift from aid to trade and investment as the focus for renewed relations between Europe and Africa can also be seen as a redefining paradigm for the entire region. Creating wealth and value in the Atlantic region will vastly depend on the nature and dynamic of economic exchanges. <clears throat> what are the new priorities and strategies for redefining the global supply chain? How are societies absorbing new and more intense levels of exchanges? When it comes to the future of the global economy, what are the expectations for the wider Atlantic? Welcome. Uh, we are all painfully aware that we stand between you and dinner and possibly a drink. So we'll try to make this entertaining and provocative. Um, uh, if we fail to be provocative, we hope that your questions will provoke us to uh, a discussion that will uh, hopefully illuminate some of these issues. I'd like to introduce our, our great panel. Uh, uh, to my extreme right is Ira Kalish, the chief uh, global economist of Deloitte. Uh, next to him is the Honorable Fernando Nelly uh, Ferrocci, Commissioner for Enterprise and Industry at the European Commission. You've met Dr. Torre already. Uh, and here on my immediate right is Marta Lucia Ramirez, the former uh, trade minister of 
Colombia. Uh, we meet at an interesting time in world trade and investment. Uh, as the video uh, pointed out, uh, it is an increasingly important and dynamic part of the world economy. The problem is it's slowing down. Uh, we had a dramatic slowdown in trade in the wake of the Great Recession, but that was to be expected. Uh, no one was lending, no one was trading, the economies in many countries had collapsed. Uh, we then had a rebound in trade, led in part by a rebound in foreign investment. But what we're seeing now is a slowdown again in world trade. Uh, the uh, World Trade Organization has revised downward its estimate of what uh, the growth in trade will be this year. Uh, they have cut it by about a third. Uh, uh, and they expect trade to grow a little bit more next year, but still much below uh, their uh, anticipated uh, growth uh, just a few months ago. Uh, we see this then in the slowdown in the world economy. The IMF has revised downward its estimates of global growth. Uh, this year, for example, it is now estimated that Trade will not lead world growth. It will lag world growth. That means it will, it will, it will actually hold back growth. Uh, and next year, there's an anticipation, a hope that it will be slightly faster than world growth, but not that much faster. So we, we face a dilemma, a challenge here in terms of trade. And since we all know that, or at least economists tell us, that investment leads trade, in other words, trade follows investment, uh, we do have to worry about whether global investment is growing fast enough to actually drive the world economy the way it has, or we became used to it driving the world economy over the last uh, generation. Uh, so I do think we have a great deal of things to talk about here. Uh, but I want to, and I, we find it useful sometimes in these sessions, to have a little bit of a reality check uh, in terms of our discussion by looking at what our publics tell us they think about trade and foreign investment, if only to have a talking point where we can contrast our views, let's face it, we are all elites here, we wouldn't be here if we weren't elites, uh, with what our publics tell us they think. So uh, it turns out that the uh, Pew Research Center uh, did a survey uh, earlier this year in 44 countries, many of the countries that are represented in this room, uh, and we asked them a number of questions about trade and investment. I can tell you on the t uh, off the top that everybody thinks that trade is good for their country. Uh, everyone everywhere has drunk the Kool-Aid, as we say in English. They get the message that this is good for their country. It's just that they aren't so sure it is good for them. Uh, so we asked people, as one of the questions, do you think that trade creates jobs or destroys jobs? So we thought before we showed you their answer, we would actually ask you in your, um, uh, uh, on your device to vote. So take out your device. The first question will be, if we could get rid of that, uh, uh, that result. We don't want to show people the result first. <laughs> um, if you, do you well, does trade create jobs or destroy jobs? That is the first question. Uh, and you have 15 seconds to answer that question. We don't seem to have it counting down, so maybe, there we are, okay. One says cr job, trade creates jobs, two says trade destroys jobs. Okay, the second question is foreign investment. I can tell you ahead of time, everyone in the, around the world, or almost everyone, loves greenfield investment. If you want to come and build a plant in our country, more, we're more than happy to have you do that. The bigger question is, what if a foreign company wants to come and buy a domestic company, foreign-led mergers and acquisitions? Do you think that's good for the country? Then hit one. I think it's bad for the country, hit two.
Okay, we're now going to look at the results. 77% of you said that trade creates jobs. 62% of you, 63% almost, I think it's at a 62.9, said buying, uh, a foreigner buying a, co a company in my country is good for my country. If you look at the results in some of the countries represented in this room, you can see some real differences here. Basically, developing countries and emerging markets believe, people in those countries believe that trade creates jobs. People in some of the advanced economies aren't so sure about that. In fact, in the United States, only 20% of people believe trade creates jobs. Now, I suggest to you that this reflects people's own life experiences. If you live in an emerging market or a developing country, it's highly likely that trade has created jobs. Globalization has created jobs in your country. If you live in the United States, where we've lost tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs over the last 20 years, in part because of trade, you might have a different view about this, because your life experience was different. Um, similarly, when we ask people about foreigners buying a domestic company, again, you see that in many of the uh, countries that we've asked this question in, there's a slight preference for having foreigners buy a domestic company in some of the developing countries and emerging markets uh, in the Atlantic region. I can tell you that actually worldwide, there's no doubt about this. People in emer most emerging markets and developing countries say this is a good, you want to buy one of our companies, go right ahead. But look at some of the answers in some of the advanced economies. Look particularly at the result in Germany. Only 19% of Germans believe that a foreigner buying a German company is a good thing. For those of you who have been following the debate in Germany recently about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and the worry in Germany about a thing called the Investor State Dispute Settlement, this is why Germans are so upset about it. They don't trust foreigners who come in and invest in their country. Uh, but it is also true that Americans aren't so enamored of this either. Um, so one of the challenges we face going forward, it seems to me, is that our publics aren't necessarily sure what, that they believe in what the economists or their public officials are telling them that, in fact, this is good for them. Um, I can tell you we don't have this one statistic up here, but economists don't tell us that trade creates jobs, and they don't tell us that trade raises wages. Politicians tell us that. This data shows in advanced economies at least people don't buy it. But what is even more disturbing is that the one thing economists do tell us is that trade lowers prices. That's the economics 101 argument about why nations should trade. <clears throat> In the 44 countries that we surveyed, there is one country where people believe that, Israel. No one else believes that anywhere in the world. They say trade either makes no difference to prices or it raises prices. So we had a lot of discussion here to have with our publics about this. When I've explained that to economists, they say, well, we'll just have to explain it to them again. I would submit to you that talking slower and talking louder to our publics is not going to work. People are telling us something here. They don't see the trickle-down effect of trade and investment the way we purport that they should. So with that question, I actually would like to ask a direct a question to Ira Kalish. As an economist, uh, how do you explain this disconnect between economic theory and elite opinion? Our elites told us it's great for jobs and it's, it's, it's great for the country and what the publics, at least in some of our countries, are telling us. Well, I think there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's two problems. One is that I've never heard a politician say that if we have more trade, it's going to lower prices. They always make the claim right. uh, that it's about jobs when it really is about lowering prices and in the yeah. process, freeing up resources that would ultimately actually create jobs. The other problem is that when it comes to trade, 
uh, the losers are more concentrated and the winners are more uh, dispersed. So if you're a loser when it comes to the impact of trade, um, you're going to lose a job. If you're a winner, you're going to see slightly lower prices. Now, the society overall benefits from that, and the real challenge for policymakers is to compensate the losers, because even if you compensate them, uh, even if the winners compensate the losers, we're all still better off. But, and that's the argument for uh, trade adjustment, which in the US we did back in the 60s with some success. There isn't a constituency for that. There isn't political leadership for that right now. Uh, Marta Lucio Ramirez, you were the trade minister of Colombia. Colombia has, for those of you who don't know, has a free trade agreement with the European Union, has a free trade agreement with the United States. If you look at these numbers, Colombia is among the least likely to believe that trade creates jobs of any of the 44 countries that we surveyed. The people are the most skeptical, the most wary. And similarly, they're pretty wary, I mean, they're divided actually, on whether foreigners buying a Colombian company is a good thing for Colombia. Um, why do you think Colombia, which actually has embraced globalization far more than maybe some other Latin American countries, why do you think they uh, are so skeptical? Uh, first of all, I believe that uh, the Colombian uh, customers benefit from free trade, but not the Colombian um, labor force because there are so many industries that close their firms, or so many uh, in the agricultural sector that lose uh, their opportunities, and now they have no employees, they have not eno enough jobs, and that's why there is a difference uh, in between uh, them. But also related with the investment. And there are so many Colombians that were so happy at the beginning of all these foreign direct investment because uh, they thought, uh, this is going to create new industries, new companies in Colombia. But at the end of the day, it was not truth. There were, there were so many Colombians who sell their firms or the industries to foreign investors, but they didn't create a new industries or they didn't create new jobs. So that's why there is this kind of uh, disappointing uh, situation for, for the common uh, people in Colombia. Uh, Commissioner uh, Forochi, um the I in TTIP is investment. It's the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, there seems to be real doubt in much of Europe about the efficacy, the value of foreign investment, especially, potentially, we don't really know what people, one of the problems with public opinion research is you don't know what people hear when you ask them about, for, who do they mean by foreigners? We do happen to know, though, that there's a lot of suspicion about American foreign investment in Europe. Well, TTIP is about enhancing the likelihood you're going to have more American foreign investment in Europe. So how does Europe deal with this a bit of a reticence about foreign investment in Europe? Yes, may I, before answering your question, I make a, a note on, on your uh, statistical uh, result out of polls uh, with an example which has to do very much with the recent history of Europe. If you look back to the history of Europe, Europe uh, and the European project was mainly based on the idea of creating a free trade area, which worked quite well. Yeah. So if you look in retrospect to the results we achieved in terms of growth, prosperity, welfare, and I think that the results of trade, more trade, and more free trade among Europeans proved to be quite uh, useful and effective. So I think uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, irrational emotions behind the results that you projected, and, uh, but this we probably will have to come back on it. On investment, uh, yes, I am aware that there are a lot of uh, speculation, preoccupation, reservations which have been raised recently, very recently, in particular on this clause that you referred to, this investment uh, state uh, dispute settlement. But I'm very surprised because, uh, by the way, these uh, preoccupations come in particular from one country and have to do a lot with one specific case which emerged in that country. But this country has signed, I can't remember how many previous agreements with other states, bilateral agreements, which include that very clause. So I think that we need to look at these things uh, uh, with a cool, cool attitude and, and, and try to be uh, convincing, of course, 
that there is nothing wrong uh, with foreign investment. Of course, there are sensitive sectors that need to be protected. And by the way, if I may add one further comment to your comment, I think that the preoccupations in Europe are much more concentrated on investment from China than from the US. Well, I, I think that's a very good point. I mean, two things that the commissioner has raised. One is we know from doing correlations with this survey research that um, it is directly correlated to the growth experience in recent years of the country. So if your country has grown uh, quite well over the last five years, your population is much more likely to say trade creates jobs, raises wages. So, um, uh, but we are in a bit of a chicken and egg debate, especially in advanced countries and especially in Europe. We think we need more trade and investment to stimulate growth, but the public, because there hasn't been trade and invest, there hasn't been growth, are skeptical of trade and investment. So it is a political challenge to sell it in that environment. Um, and I do think you're right. I mean, I, I think it's very interesting to think about what the impact of growing Chinese investment, especially in Europe and the United States, is going to be in the long run. We're just on the cusp of major Chinese investment. Um, and uh, I'd be curious, Ira, I was going to actually ask you this later, but I'll ask it to you now. Is China the 800-pound gorilla in the room that no one wants to talk about? Um, no, actually, it's the elephant in the room, I okay. think. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, China is enormously important. If you go back, say, 30 or 40 years, at that time, economic relations in the Atlantic Basin were within the Atlantic Basin. Uh, then over a 30-year period, China was the fastest growing country in the world and started importing massive amounts of commodities from Africa and Latin America, started welcoming a huge amount of investment from Europe and the U.S., started producing a huge amount of consumer products that they exported to the U.S. and Europe. Uh, so China suddenly became enormously important to the Atlantic Basin. But now uh, China is changing. It has slowed down considerably. Uh, its exports are barely growing. It's moving up the value chain and it's shedding a lot of that, those low-wage jobs uh, as their wages go up and their currency goes up. Um, and they're scaling back all that massive and a lot of wasted investment uh, that they've done, so they're not buying as many commodities. So for here in the Atlantic Basin, that means less commodity exports from Latin America and Africa, and for those countries, the need to think about what they're going to do next because they're not going to grow on that basis going forward. It means um, that China becomes more of a consumer market, and for companies in throughout the Atlantic Basin, there's a greater opportunity to export uh, products, not just commodities, to China. Um, and it means that what happens in China is going to have a big impact on, the, on all of our regions. And we have to think in different ways about how we're going to deal with that. Dr. Torrey, um, one of the hopeful results of this survey has been the acceptance in parts of Africa that we surveyed of trade and foreign investment, the belief that it creates jobs, that foreign investment is good for the country. Um, I can tell you a conversation I had with the head of the American Electronics Association a few years ago where I asked him, I said, where do, you, where do your CEOs say they're going to be producing things in a generation from now? And without even equivocating, he said, well, we're going to be producing in Africa, of course. And I said to him at the time, how can that be? I mean, they have civil wars, you don't have infrastructure, you don't have a, uh, a trained workforce. And he said, yeah, you're describing China in the late 1940s. You know, this is, this is fixable. But I'm curious from your position, uh, having been uh, in a leadership position, wrestling with these problems, um, is Africa up to the challenge of getting the infrastructure right, getting corruption under control, getting the educational system in place so that Africa can take advantage of what it would appear that both the Chinese and the Americans and the Europeans see as this is maybe the next production base for a lot of our manufacturing. Well, uh, let me recall uh, some figures. Um, according to the African Bank, between 250 to 300 million African will raise to be part of the middle class, mm -hmm. meaning coming with a purchasing power. I do believe that Africa is the last frontier of the global economy. Whether we like it or not, that is what is going to happen. Now your question is, are we going to be ready for that? 
uh, let me a little bit, you know, rain on the parade. Uh, let's talk about fair trade for a minute. Yeah. It's not trade at all cost. I think we are tired of the way we've been doing trade before, where you come and take the resources and there is no value chain and nothing, and then when it's over, you're gone for another continent. That is going to be over because there is a new leadership, and I believe that uh, African people are now sort of being more aware and more in a position of defending their interests. So it's going to be a different conversation. Mm -hmm. That brings China into the equation. Uh, let me tell you that we have a different vision of China. I heard yesterday that, well, they are not looking into um, sort of, you know, human rights issues, and that wasn't much of a concern for other powers when they were in, to yeah. recall that. Um, and second, mm -hmm. they're facing a different leadership where we come and discuss our interest. And let me tell you one thing. Uh, China is maybe more ready, uh, and we can see how they're making inroads in Africa, because they don't come with stereotypes, mm -hmm. and they, not come, they come with a fresh vision, um, and they're not sort of having the old bags of colonialism. Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about issues. Um, because I think, and being in a position of discussing with different investors, um, China, not long ago, used to be in the position of, of Africa. So they understand where we're coming from. But of course, we are not naive at all. Uh, it's about profit. It's about business. Um, and we have to be ready for that. Uh, it means tackling good governance. I talked about it rec um, 30 minutes ago. It's about more uh, effective training of young people, vocational training. Uh, it's about joint venturing, because I think that's what we would like to see, a win-win situation. Because, I mean, it's not opening again our supermarket and everybody come with its basket and, and, and shop and go. That's not what we're looking forward to. What we are looking forward to is a win-win situation. And I think it's important that we start building that, that discourse um, where business will be profitable to development, because unfortunately, it has not been the case. It seems to be a, you know, an evidence, but it, it, it's not. So we would like to see more social responsibility from corporation. We would like to see joint venturing with local enterprises. We would like to see technology transfer for Africa. And all those issues will be in a discussion in a different mode. That's how I see things. And I'm optimistic because what I'm seeing is uh, you know, African leadership being more demanding in terms of defending uh, the interests of their own country. Let me ask both you and Marta the same question, get a, maybe a slightly different response, maybe the same. Um, on one hand, you both have growing domestic markets that need to be serviced. And to the extent that foreigners are willing to invest, to, to produce for those markets, um, uh, that's an undoubtedly good for both Colombia or, or Senegal or, or West Africa. It seems to me one of the challenges, though, that emerging markets like yours face is that there are standards in the global market that have been set by the West. There's no doubt about this. And I'm not talking about environmental standards. I'm not talking about labor standards. I'm talking about simple things like quality standards, uh, the zero defect uh, demands that are now in place in, in advanced markets, the um, health and safety standards that are exceptionally high, that are difficult to meet, not because people don't want to, but they're expensive and they're, and they're, and they're, they're uh, demanding. Um, those were standards that are set by advanced markets. Maybe not for nefarious reasons, maybe because that's what their consumers want. But still, to enter into the global market and be a major player, it seems to me there is a challenge there to meet the, to rise up to those standards almost overnight. I'd be curious to get either one of your thoughts about that. I really believe that, yes, there, there is a chance. And in, in my opinion, there is also a responsibility for governments to promote the competitiveness of industries, the competitiveness of uh, agricultural and agribusinesses uh, companies in order to be part of this global change, uh, to be part of the international trade, but also in order to 
uh, to provide better quality goods for the for the your, for your own consumers. In the Colombian case, we are 46 million people population, so we have the opportunity to have not only national companies but also to import goods from different places in the world. And what is important is that consumers have a better chances to, to choose, but also that we have these national companies exporting to different mm -hmm. markets in the region or in the entire world. And that's why we decided to, to have these free trade negotiations. Yeah. Well, it's a part of what I call fair trade. It's yeah. also putting, putting in the package of negotiation improving the quality of human resources uh -huh. so to cater to the, to the particular market we are in. And that's what we've been seeing. Some part of the, the, the deals I have witnessed is, okay, you want to do business, but let's see the package you're bringing, including training for the personnel, including transferring technology. It has to be a package. It's not only making money and, 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 and living. So that's how I see it, if we want to make sure that it's a win-win situation, and, and it has to be. I, I do, I would only second that, because I, I remember vividly being in Libya before the revolution and being uh, uh, talking to people who wanted to export to Europe fruits and vegetables. Great opportunity for Libya to do that, great growing season. But they bitterly complained about European standards, safety standards. And I tried to convince them that you know, they're not going to lower their standards so that they can buy your fruits and vegetables. Mr. Commissioner, we believe that, or we have believed to this point, that negotiations, trade negotiations, investment negotiations lead to um, better outcomes for our countries. The problem is these trade negotiations aren't going so well these days. TTIP has not progressed as fast, I think, as some people hoped it would. Uh, the WTO has not produced uh, for years now. Um, is that mechanism of formal trade agreements an artifact of the past that even though we don't have a better way to do it, we have to acknowledge that this may not be the way to do it in the future? Well, uh, I think you're absolutely right when you uh, assume that the multilateral track is stuck this is a reality. This is probably one of the reasons why we went for the TTIP with the United States of America, because there was a recognition worldwide that there is little chance in, in the short uh, period of time ahead of us to, 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 to look for, for, to really be able to, to agree on something significant uh, at multilateral level. Now, on the bilateral track, I am a bit less pessimistic. Uh, we have a record of, of a number of agreements uh, concluded uh, in the last few years. I mean, speaking uh, as, as a European on behalf of the European Union. Uh, whether they would be able uh, to make the difference, uh, this is something we will have to test. I mean, uh, the agreements uh, in some cases are there. They are being implemented now. Some of them are still being negotiated. Whether or not they are going to really be able to make the difference, we, we will have to make. Uh, but I wanted for a moment, if you allow me, to come back to the, to the question of uh, foreign investment, which we've been discussing before, because I want to note a very uh, schizophrenic attitude in most of the countries in, in Europe in particular. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, we are doing our best to attract foreign investment. Uh, we're setting special programs, we try to improve regulations, we try to improve legislation. We also establish special agencies that are there to attract foreign investment, and whenever there is a, an important foreign investment, there is a big fuss in public opinion. This is particularly true for the country that you mentioned, uh, which is now the one that seems to have more problems with foreign investment. I am convinced that foreign investment are a good thing, but of course you have to convince also public opinions, as your Paul showed. Thank you. I thought it was very artful of him to talk about a particular country twice without mentioning its name, I would point out to you that it's not Greece and it starts with G. Um, now, uh, we're going to open this up to conversation with the audience. Um, uh, you can uh, post uh, questions or comments uh, on, on your systems, or uh, if you just raise your hand and I will call on you, please identify yourself and keep your uh, question uh, short and to the point if you can. Who would like to go first? Right here. Bring a microphone at him.
Hi, um, my name's Catherine and I'm from the US. Um, so to me, it seems like there's actually been um, a lot of initiatives led by the US to increase trade with Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, such as uh, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which allows for free, uh, free trade with most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, covering thousands of different of particular items. Um, also, the, uh, the, uh, there's another initiative, the Trade Africa Initiative. So, um, however, last year imports from Sub-Saharan Africa were actually down about 21% from the year prior. And in terms of total imports from, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, it's only 2% of the, the imports that the U.S. Uh, receives per year. So my question for you is, with this in mind, what are the main impediments to trade between the U.S. and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular? Is it supply? Is it infrastructure, regulations, um, standards, like you mentioned with, uh, with Libya, uh, logistics, and how can they be overcome? We'll take one more question if there is one. Um, right here in, in the back. Thank you very much. My name is Franklin Kujo, and I run a think tank in Ghana called Imani. Uh, I'm a bit f worried about this fixation of uh, China, especially with African countries. And I think I'd like to make a comment and then probably ask a question afterwards. Um, while we are, well, most African leaders are refusing to accept that the standards that have been set by the West clearly are the standards that we need at home to do proper business and essentially draw a lot of investment. Um, as the former prime minister going to tell us, essentially what the lessons they are learning, not just your country, but my country, I could share a lot of experiences working with China and learning with great disappointment that after signing all these nice deals, the dollars don't flow because we are weak in showing the profitability and the viability of projects those things that you require uh, would be required of you if you were trading with a Western country. And I think that China is providing an excuse for us to build these reforms because whereas the World Bank, for instance, in my country had voted billions for infrastructure-related projects, because we have to do the, not the difficult work, but the disciplined work of filling the forms and ensuring that every dollar counts, we don't. We rather leave 1.5 billion dollars sitting in the vaults of the Ghanaian government, which is unused. And the World Bank publishes all these projects. Meanwhile, we were chasing a fictitious loan from China for four years, and we learned with great disappointment that with the Chinese, if we don't show a million, you can't get a billion. How are we addressing those issues? Thank okay. you. Uh, Dr. Torrey, the first question. Um, what do you think needs to be done uh, and is it from the American side or the African side to enhance the trade relationship with the United States? Well, I think she answered to her own question. I think yeah. she laid out most of the yeah. obstacle. Um, the first one, and I think we talked about this, is how to raise the quality of production. It, it speaks to, to training, it speaks to, um, to infrastructure. It, 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 I mean, all these things that helps you to be up there. But uh, the AGOA uh, agreement, my remark to it is it needed you know, some of a policy to, 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 to support countries to perform, I would say. Um, otherwise, it, it, it doesn't work, because you're finding a country that is dealing with its own challenges um, you know, as you lay them out. And if you don't add to the agreement sort of a partnership whether it's technical, logistically, etc., it, it, it won't happen. So it's there, and you know, countries by themselves are not able to, 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 to meet to the standard. So it has to be, as I said again, sort of a, a, a package. It's not only, okay, you're allowed to, 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 to export X, Y, Z um, in such a manner, but it's also about a cooperation on how to do that. So I think we have to rethink. That's why I was talking about fair trade, I think it's, it's a new world. I mean, we talk about the kind of leadership we need to develop, the, the new leadership, it, that's what it is. It's a win-win situation. I'm going to help you to be a better producer, 
to raise the standard, the quality of your human resources. I'm going to see how we can partner for building infrastructure. In return, mm -hmm. I'm opening my market because I need you to come in. That's the way I would look at it. So it takes a, a shift in, in the business uh, community. I, I know it's, a, it's like a, you know, I'm preaching, but yeah. that's the way to go. And I'd like to just quickly talk about a sector that maybe might help us to go that way. It's agriculture. Because of the food crisis, Africa, let's remember, 60% of the land is still not exploited. So it's a huge avenue. So the food stock will be <laughs> going down. So we'll, you know, a lot of investors will turn their eyes to Africa. So at that point, maybe what I'm saying will need to happen if you want to feed the rest of the, <laughs> the world. So that's the way I would look at it. It takes a different framework in the business community. It's not only about, of course it's about profit, but what's the best way to get to profit while sustaining also the environment, sustaining the, product, the, the production system, increasing the quality of the human resources. And I think that's where people do business you know, fairly and I would say also happily. So. Yeah. Marta, Colombia actually has, to my mind as an observer, developed some very good niche markets in the global economy. Uh, flowers, for example as Kenya has as well. Uh, things that you, when we, I would say 20 years ago, thought about trade, you wouldn't think about trading flowers across long distances, but it's, it actually proved to be a very viable business and a very lucrative business and a, a, an adept selection of a, of a niche market. Is Colombia's experience in how one finds one way in the, in the global economy and finds those niches something that other countries can learn from? The niche that you have mentioned, uh, it was very important for us. It's still important, the, the, the cut flowers. But now we are using this experience in order to develop, for example, organics. Uh, organic food, which is so important, not only for uh, the health, uh, and, and, and of course, for better quality uh, food in the world, but also because it creates richness. It creates this value added in the agribusinesses. And uh, the, the, the problem we have is that uh, the last uh, 15 years, it's a problem, uh, we, uh, Colombia started uh, having more and more and more oil, more coal, more uh, the energy sector exporting. So it creates this kind of uh, that uh, sick in the, in the Colombian economy. And that's why the manufactured goods and these uh, kind of uh, exports have been affected because of the exports of, of oil. But let me mention something else. It, it seems to me that the policy makers have to be very focused in help the private sector uh, in order to have, for example, more innovation. Uh, we decided to use the um, loyalties from the oil exports and coal exports to increase innovation investment in some specific industries, in some specific agribusinesses, in order to, to have in the future uh, the recovery of these non-oil and non-commodity uh, non, uh, uh, exports uh, only. I see a couple of hands up there, yeah, in the front and then in the back. Hi, my name is Jose Antonio Zybert, and uh, this is a very pragmatic question linking the previous sessions and this current one, linking uh, trade and corruption. And uh, basically, this is a question to Dr. Turo. Um, when you decided to tackle corruption, what were your first steps? What was your strategy? I would say, I, I make this question because usually in Brazil, um, Many politicians, when they face a certain challenge, they say, oh, let's uh, rewrite the statue. Let's publish another one, and then uh, we tackle the challenge. And uh, linking this, this, the, this questions to another one, uh, what would, in your, under, in your opinion, what is the greatest challenge to fight uh, corruption? Following Professor Lawrence Lassig, would it be uh, to reform campaign finance? Thank you. In the back, we have another question. Yeah.
Hi, thanks for a very interesting discussion about trade. Uh, my name is Arba Kokalari, I'm from Sweden. Um, I think there is a really big gap between when we talk about that we need more trade, more markets must be included, more countries must be included, but how we actually act. Uh, we see the new free trade agreement, hopefully, it comes now, it's 2014, it's way too late. Uh, the free trade agreement between the states and Europe. And Europe and the United States have suffered from stagnation economically, while we see the countries, many countries in Africa who have an economic growth. Why are we still not giving these countries a chance to actually trade with us? Why are we still substituting our own uh, industries in Europe and in the United States and why do we still have so many tariffs and obstacles to actually make uh, more, a more inclusive trade in the world? The protectionism that we have is devastating for our economies. Why are we talking about that? We're just saying that we need to include more, but we're not acting to actually do it. I think this question is uh, primarily to the commissioner. Okay, and right here, one, one final question, yes. Actually, my question is, follows on directly from that and is perhaps half an answer. Peter, introduce yourself, yeah. So, sorry, is that better? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Keldon. I'm also a pollster. I was watching Green with Envy, Bruce, your figures. But I wanted to link your figures to your point about, well, surely free trade is better because the winners can compensate the losers and everybody's better off. The problem with that is you need a mechanism. And the normal mechanism is taxation. But at the moment, across the world, pretty well every government has huge demands on their tax revenue. Uh, it's impossible for them to borrow very much. Um, and there's tax competition. Therefore, it seems to me that the mechanism no longer really exists in the real world for governments to raise tax from the winners to hand on to the losers. And therefore, you get the political response against TTIP and against other forms of free trade. So my question to the panel is, uh, is there a creative solution to that? Is there a way one can restart the momentum towards free trade in new ways in which you can persuade the potential losers they can still be better off? Uh, Dr. Troy, the, I'll get, ask you to answer the question about corruption. And one of the things I find interesting when we talk about corruption and I'll share with you a, a statistic we had, it's not appropriate to the Atlantic, but in China, where people said corruption was one of the number one problems facing the country, and it was all due to private business. And I thought, corruption by its very definition is, a, is an equation, and on one hand there is, a, there is a private business, and on the other hand there's a corrupt official. So uh, in this case, the question about corruption, it seems to me, is, You've got foreign businesses that are offering bribes, maybe, and you've got officials who want to take bribes. How do you balance the way you discipline that in a, in a country setting? I just want to recall that there is an international convention against corruption, yeah. which try to address what you're saying, because um, to have a corruption activity, it's not bad to recall that you need somebody who is <laughs> delivering the money and somebody who's receiving it. So um, most of the time, the corrupter is from a foreign country and you have the public official that is here. So we do have that convention that really set norms and standards. So that's to answer how do you go about it. I think we are most of countries are signatories to the, to the convention and they have to uh, bring the standard within the legal framework, which Senegal has done, uh, and it speaks to you know, declaring your asset, to putting an office against corruptions, to doing annual auditing, and et cetera. That these are standards that are clearly laid, off, laid out in the, in the convention. So that's a way to go about it. And the second thing is, we do have now a space where you can pursue cases internationally. Meaning that if you are a foreign investor practicing a corruption, I don't know, in a foreign country, you can be uh, pursued in court in, in Europe or in the US, which is a huge step forward, which means that we have now an inter international mechanism 
to do that. And I think we have to depart from the idea that corruption can fasten business, because that is also a philosophy we are hearing. OK, why don't you hand out money so you know, your business will go quicker, you'll save money? I, 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 it, it doesn't happen that way. What is happening is it's public money uh, that is supposed to go to social sectors, to development that goes to private accounts. So that we have to pass that. Mr. Commissioner, the question about why we can't move faster on these trade agreements and why we cannot um, do better trade agreements with poor countries. Uh, just I will share with you one anecdote. I remember when the European Union announced its any, everything but arms agreement with Africa. I called up a friend of mine who was then the number two at one of the commission offices. And I congratulate him. And he started laughing. And I said, why, why are you laughing? I'm trying to congratulate you. And he said, do you really think we would have done this if we thought they could, they could actually sell us anything? Um, it was a very cynical statement that these things were not as good as they purported to be. So how do we get trade agreements, both between us across the Atlantic and north-south, that are more meaningful? And we have one of our questions from Reinhard Budokopper of the uh, European Parliament up here. Uh, can we expect we'll actually get the transatlantic deal done um, over the next two years, or are we going to have to wait till the next administration in, in Washington? Well, uh, first of all, let me say that I feel relieved uh, after having listened to the last two interventions because there were an expression of strong support for trade liberalization after so many voices of concerns and reservations. But why we didn't succeed, why, first of all, we didn't uh, go for the TTIP before? Because uh, this is quite strange, in fact, given the level of interdependence between the two economies across the Atlantic, European and American, uh, one should have expected that we would have gone for an agreement before. In fact, uh, probably because the, the economies were sufficiently interdependent and interconnected, interconnected already, there, 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 there wasn't uh, the, the sense of urgency for such an agreement. In fact, we realized at some stage that we could have done a lot better, both in terms of uh, increasing trade but also increasing investment, if we were able to eliminate or to reduce substantially the barriers that still exist uh, in trade uh, among uh, the two sides of the Atlantic. So I'm still referring to this uh, mm -hmm. uh, North North trade agreements. Uh, what went wrong? I, well, this is difficult to say. Certainly, the political uh, the conditions, the probably the economic conditions that were there when we launched the negotiations in uh, the summer of last year, 2013, have probably changed. Uh, if you look at it from an American perspective, what we have seen has been a constant reduction in the political determination to go for an agreement. Now, the fact that for instance, the administration was not able or willing to get a, a, a fast track by Congress is indicative of the insufficient lack of political determination, not to mention the resistance and reluctances in Congress. Uh, and in Europe, there are growing concerns. Uh, some of them uh, I would label as more of an emotional nature, but which will need to be taken into account because at the end of the day, this agreement will have to be ratified by national parliaments, not to mention the European Parliament. So uh, there were some probably, uh, there was probably an overambitious attempt. The, the, the idea that we could include so many issues at the same time was probably uh, one of the reasons why we didn't succeed. Uh, if I think at subject like the GMOs or subject like the um, for instance, this idea that we could send to reconcile the precautionary principle which prevails in Europe with a much more scientific approach uh, which prevails uh, in, 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 in the United States when it comes to protection of consumer or food safety requirements. These are things that are probably untouchable. Now, it's completely different uh, if you look at the other perspective, the uh, north-south uh, negotiation, because there you have to negotiate on a totally different basis, and they were sufficiently well illustrated by Prime Minister Ture. I don't have to, to enter into this. Of course, you have to take into consideration that you start from different conditions of departure, and this is a, it's a different story. One, I, you've got the last word. Uh, as Peter <coughs> suggested, uh, we seem to be in a bit of a race to the bottom on taxes um, uh, in many countries. Uh, but taxes were the way we compensated the losers 
uh, uh, at the expense of the winners in a, in, a, in a market system that included trade, but also just domestically. Um, uh, is there a chance that that won't continue? Is there a chance we can turn that around? Is there another way to equilibrate the system, do you think? Yes, you, you don't have to raise taxes to spend more money. You can borrow the money. And I know that sounds um, antithetical to everything that a lot of people believe, but countries like Germany, France, the US, Britain, their borrowing costs are historically low. Yeah. So if they, if they borrowed the money and invested that in uh, trade adjustments as a way to compensate the losers and lower trade barriers, the society would still be better off, the economy would grow faster, the tax revenue would come back to pay off those relatively limited debts. The problem is that politicians have not done a good job of explaining that protection is a tax. And it substantially raises the, the price that consumers pay. I remember back in the 1980s um, when President Reagan in the US imposed protection to, to protect um, auto workers from Japanese competition. Um, and that meant that consumers were paying higher prices for all cars. And the, the prices they paid meant that the cost per auto worker, and these were auto workers who at that time were making maybe $25,000, $30,000 a year, the cost of protection was $100,000 per job saved. It would have been cheaper to let the auto companies lay off those workers and just have the government pay their salaries. It would have been far cheaper, and consumers would have paid lower prices for the cars. So there's a huge cost involved in protection. And at a time like this, um, and, and I'm not optimistic about trade agreements right now, but if we were to get a good one uh, that did impose some costs on some producers, uh, I think government doesn't have to raise taxes necessarily. When you have economies that are barely growing, that are close to deflation, and that have historically low interest rates, it makes sense to borrow the money. I think the markets are actually telling us that. I think you're absolutely right. Indeed. Um, that's controversial, though, I know, in Europe. So we'll, uh, very, we'll, leave, it at, very, we'll leave it very, at that. Very controversial. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you all for a very good session. I'd like to thank our panelists. And I would like to liberate all of you to go eat and drink and be merry this evening and, and, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Bruce, our thanks to you for really a terrific Terrific last session today. Thank you very much indeed. A few very quick items to mention to you. Uh, first, as Bruce has told you, there is now going to be dinner, uh, which is going to be in the fountain courtyard of the Hotel du Golf. Um, and there will be night owls after that at 9.45. And then the most important thing of all, to remember to uh, change the time this evening. Uh, you, the clocks, you go back, you fall back one hour uh, this evening. So enjoy the evening, enjoy the night owls. Thank you very much.